It's my job to start out a series uh, that's here in the series entitled Who Changed the Rules? And I love this, uh, again, when Matt and Chris, uh, uh, Zach, several of us met to, uh, to discuss this whole year and, and plan out the, what the year would look like. And uh, this one was intriguing to me. And I'm so thankful that I get a chance to be on this particular week. Now, I'm not thankful that I get a chance to, to set it up for the whole week because I'm not sure I'll do the best job of that. But I am excited about this particular subject. And here's why. Dating is a world that I live in. I- I'm married, so don't, <laughs> don't think it in terms of I date other women. Okay, that, that's not the case. I'm not that kind of a, anyway. I'm not there, but I, I live in the world of college students and young singles. So that's part of my job description up in, uh, in Atlanta is to work with college students and those in, primarily in their 20s. And so this is a world that I stay involved in on a pretty regular basis. So it is literally every month that I'll get a question from somebody, whether it's email or text or whatever it may be, about how do I apply this biblical standard to this? And so let me let the cat out of the bag first, which will help us set this up. The Bible says extraordinarily little about dating. However, the Bible addresses dating in plenty. There is so much instruction about how we should go about this, but what you will not find is any section of Scripture that's set up in first or second opinions that you can go to and get and find. This is what the Lord says about our system. This is how we date. You're going to be sorely disappointed if you search for it. Now, you may be past that stage. You may be saying, I'm no longer dating. It's, uh, I'm married. It's not something that I'm looking uh, to, to do anymore. Yes, I would still encourage you to date your wife. But what we mean by this is the system itself of how to choose a spouse. So not what to do with your spouse in the context of marriage, but how do you go about the process of choosing your spouse? The Bible says extraordinarily little about that particular subject. What it says a tremendous about, though, is about how to treat people. And this is what we want to talk about. Who changed the rules um, in here? Uh, First thing that you need to know is that rule-based systems are bound to change, and they're bound to have exceptions. So here's what we do. In subjects like this, where the scriptures, uh, God says, I'm going to give you an ideal here. I'm going to give you a particular Uh, uh, ideal that I want for my people. And so what we do then is we take these rules and we attach all these rules to it and they're bound to change and they're bound to have exceptions that are created. Give an example from uh, just the secular world. Don't take secular in any wrong context. There's nothing, uh, uh, no shot at that. It's just meaning that it's outside the scriptures and outside of religion in particular. Uh, Sports. James Naismith came up with this game called basketball. Way back in the 1800s, late 1800s, comes a great game. It was just played. Yes, that other team on the other side of Chapel Hill won it this particular year. Can't even refer to them, but you know who they are. So they won it this year. Uh, Again, great game. When it started out, this is how it started out. We're going to put a little leather ball into a peach basket, and every time you score, we're going to have to get a ladder, climb up there, get the ball out, and we'll start all over again. Took a long time to play. As the game progressed, as the game advanced, the rules changed in the process. There was actually a rule that came about in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, it was the 70s, in which you could not dunk the basketball. Now, I know for most of us now, we say, why in the world would you ever take the most exciting play in basketball out of the game? But they said, we're going to make it so that you can't dunk anymore. And so dunking was not allowed in the game. Then they realized fans really like it. People like me who wish I was 6'4", have dreams of doing this on a basketball goal. They, we just love to watch it, so they had to put it back in. The game is going to change. The rules are going to change. There's going to be exceptions that are made to the, to the rules. So here's what God did. I'll give you an example for it now in the, in the Christian world, in the biblical world, in God's world. Do not eat of the fruit of the tree. Remember what Eve said? Can't even look at it. Now, that's actually not what God said. What she did was she added a particular rule to it. And so we said, if God says this, then what we're going to do is we're going to make a rule that places us a little bit further back because if we get right here, which is where the line is, God says, don't cross this, then we say, well, we may, may, may need to make a rule that's right here. And, and so then we make another rule that comes back here and another rule that comes back here until we finally don't even realize what, what was God's rule after all? What was his ideal? When we live in a rules-based system, 
then all, the rules are always going to change. I'll give you another example. In the scriptures there with Moses, when God's giving him the commands, the Ten Commands, God's ideals, God's ways for having his people live, he says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And you know what happened by the time Jesus hit the scene? They had made a rule that went from, here's the rule, here's the, the, the ideal from God, remember the Sabbath day, treat it like none other, it's the Lord's day, uh, honor me with, that's what God says. Well, then here's what we need to do. And, and so they added a column over here, and then they added another column and another column, and there were actually three and a half columns worth of information as to what it meant to honor the Sabbath day, one of which was actually you can't walk on grass on Sunday or Saturday for them. Can't walk on grass. God said, remember the Sabbath day. Can't walk on grass. Anytime we have man-made rules that we add to God's idea, the rules are always going to change. We're always going to find exceptions to those rules. Second thing, culturally, relationship rules, dating, sex, marriage, divorce, are changing faster and faster right now. <laughs> um, if you have grandparents that are still living, ask them what their understanding of dating was when they were growing up radically different world than what is going on presently in this day and age. All right, now, I'm not particularly old. Now, to some of you, you may look and say, dude, you're, you're really old. Quit fooling yourself. I'm really not. I'm 44. I'll be 45 in, uh, in, in August. In 1988, that was the spring that I graduated from high school. So my high school years were spent in those mid-80s, the glory days, right, when music was at its best, during that time when fashion was clearly at its best as well. The hair that men and women wore back in that time was awesome. The leather pants from rock stars, that was, it was just obnoxious. It was a great era. I loved it. Back in that day, though, still was true in Montgomery, Alabama, girls could not call boys. Couldn't do it. Could not pick up the phone and call them. Now, keep in mind, the phones actually had cords that were attached to them into the wall. You had to be confined to one room when you walk until that great cordless phone came out. You, know, and you could get like 10 feet away from the little monitor there. Girls could not call boys because that was a faux pas. Okay, now with phones, people don't even, don't even make a phone call anymore. It's an entire conversation through text that's taken place. Or it's this Snapchat, it's this, you know, you snap these pictures and send them, and there's a whole conversation that takes place in just pictures. The rules are changing faster and faster and faster than ever as it relates to dating, as it relates to sex, marriage, and divorce. Here's the good news. God gives us ideals and instruction. His ideals stand the test of time. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. It was true for Moses and it's true for you. They never change. It doesn't matter what era you're in, no matter how bad the hair is in that era, no matter how good it is now, it doesn't matter what culture you're from, it doesn't matter what race you are, it just doesn't matter. It is true in, let's say, 1500 B.C. It's going to be true in 3500 A.D. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. His ideals are never going to change. In fact, his ideals that he gives us is actually not so that we will be become fearful and motivated by fear to, to do what he says or else. It's here's the way to live. My ideals are set up for you to have maximum joy and pleasure in life. This is the way that I have designed the universe. This is the way I have designed people. This is the way to live. Do not murder. Why not? Because I'm a God who is a life giver, and I want you to reflect me. Do not take advantage of people. Why? Because I am a God 
who comes to those who are disenfranchised. I, in, I intentionally seek after those who can't do something for themselves, and I do it for them. So when you take something from someone else that doesn't belong to you, it doesn't reflect me. And I'm putting my church on this globe called the Israelites in the Old Testament, called the church in the New Testament, I'm putting my people on this globe so that the world might see who I am and how I operate. Let me give you an example of this. Now, Matt will, I'm sure, will talk more about this. I'm sorry I can't resist this, Matt. If I'm taking stuff from you next week, I apologize, bro. God gives the command, no sex outside of marriage. Why? Is it because sex is bad? No, because God goes out of his way to let us know it's a good thing. It's his idea. He's the one that created it. He's, the, he's not embarrassed by it at all, ever. But he says, here's the way that I want you to use it. Why? It's because of this whole thing called a covenant. In, in other words, there are tremendous blessings that will come your way. Tremendous blessings to be had. But you cannot have all the blessings from God without coming to him on his terms through what's called a covenant. So I make a covenant with him in which I say there are no other gods in which I'm going to serve that no one else will get my love, attention, devotion, affection. I will bow down to nothing else. It will be to you only. And once we come to God on those terms, it's the intention of our heart. We will never fulfill that to perfection. But the intention of our heart is this, and he says, enjoy all of the blessings and all the benefits. So he established this thing called marriage on the earth in order to give us a picture of how he relates to his people, a covenant relationship where there's a constant stream of forgiveness. That whether or not you are faithful to me with all of your responsibilities, I will choose to be faithful to you because that's what God does for us. So you can't step in. You can't have all of the privileges of what marriage is supposed to be without first entering into the covenant. Why no sex outside of marriage? Because there's not a covenant. Can't have the blessings without the covenant responsibility. But once you step into that covenant responsibility, then you can enjoy freely. See, God's stuff never changes. God's design is so that we would experience the fullness of life, the fullness of joy. And when we choose to do it differently, usually what ends up happening is people get hurt. Third thing, inserting or trying to insert God's ideals, instructions into culture's rules for relationships is ultimately destined to fail. And here's what we mean by that. Trying to take the world's system that they have set up for something and then injecting Christ into that and saying, well, I'm going I'm to still do what the world does, but yet I'm just going to try to make it look and, and smell a, a little bit better. Um, it is always destined for failure. It won't work. God's system, God's ideals are at times polar opposite of the world systems. That's not always true, but many times it is true. And so trying to just insert a little bit of Jesus in order to make it better just will not work on many occasions. I can't remember who the first person was to say this. No, Mark Driscoll out in Seattle um, talked about this several times for many years, but Three basic approaches that we want to have towards culture. Number one, what is it that we can reflect from culture? Meaning, there are certain things culture does that as a Christian community, we just need to reflect it. Here's an example. The style of dress. I, I, I have a shirt on today. This is not a Christian shirt. It's a shirt. I, I wore this shirt because other people are wearing shirts that are similar to this. Now, I typically stay about a year and a half to two years behind the fashion. It, <laughs> That's not my, it's not intentionally, it's just, that's just me. So if I ever look in style, it's because my wife dressed me. Okay, I wear this because culture is wearing this at large. You know what my preference would be to wear on a Sunday morning, actually? I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama. My preference would be a seersucker suit with white bucks <laughs> and a bow tie. I would look like Colonel Sanders every Sunday if I could do that. I dress like this because this is the way that culture dresses. It even pains me to have my shirt untucked most of the time. I'm that guy that likes to have it tucked in. People wear their shirts untucked now. I just reflect culture. Is there anything right or wrong with that? No. I, 
I just don't want to look like I still belong in the 80s. Let's reflect culture. Another thing that we can do is to redeem culture. What is it that we need to step in, take that what it has, um, what's there in and of itself is not wrong, but what we need to do is to redeem it. Here's a great example. Um, music. Music is not wrong in and of itself. I would even make the statement or the claim that music is right. It's good. It's of God. It was his idea. It stirs our soul. It somehow or another fastens itself to our soul. It stirs us in a way that oftentimes speech cannot. I mean, just this morning, if I do not give to you the gospel this morning, in some ways, yes, bad me, poor me, but in some ways it's okay because it was so clearly sung this morning. So clearly in front of the, the rock, first time I heard that one, doesn't move, don't move. I can't remember the exact words, rock, don't move, what was it? Okay. It, when we just went on this string of music that talked about the faithfulness of God, is there anybody in here that just kind of went, Pah. I don't really feel anything. There's nothing really going on. If that's the case, then you probably weren't listening to the words or for whatever other reason you may have been distracted, et cetera. But if you were dialed in, my guess is you were moved just like I was moved. Music stirs us. There are several forms of music that I'd say is used in a, in a really bad way. Can we, can we redeem it? Can we reclaim it? Can we take it and do something? Martin Luther took an old bar tune that people would sit and get extraordinarily intoxicated to. I'm not against bars. Please don't hear that. Um, but, but folks would just get sloppy drunk with. He took the exact same tune that they were getting uh, drunk with, and he created a hymn out of it. He created a hymn that we sing even to this day. Let's redeem it. The last thing that we need to look at, though, is what is it we need to just reject from culture? There's some things that we don't want to reflect. It can't be redeemed. We just flat out need to reject it and come up with an alternate system. Now, one of those systems I would make the claim is the dating system that we have. Turn your Bibles uh, with me real quick to uh, Mark chapter 2. We'll begin reading in uh, verse uh, 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why did John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Pause here real quick. In essence, what they're doing, and you, um, th this is what's happening. They're coming to him and saying, Why are you not obeying the rules? Why are you not doing what's clearly the right thing to do? And Jesus is going to give them this response. Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? Now, I'll explain this in a minute, but their eyes at this point go, whoop. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Jesus, why are you not obeying the rules? And Jesus says, let me tell you something, I'm the bridegroom. Now for us, that makes a whole lot of sense. We're familiar with other passages in the scripture where Jesus says, I'm married to the church, you're the church, he, we're the bride, he's the, he's the groom, we get that. Right here, the only option they had was to hear that the bridegroom was the one who was married to the people of Israel. That's God himself. Jesus is saying, me and Yahweh, we're one. I'm God. He starts talking about this bridegroom thing, and they're going, oh, wow. He says, when the bridegroom is here, we rejoice, we celebrate, meaning this. 
while I'm here, this is far more about me. This really isn't about this system. The, the ideal is that you would see this old system, the whole Old Testament ceremonial law, not the moral law, but the ceremonial law, which was designed to point towards a person, and it pointed towards him. He says, here I am. All right, it's all pointing towards me, and since I'm here, we're going to celebrate. And what's going to happen is I'm going to die, and then you're going to mourn, and you're going to fast, and I'm going to come back from the dead. And I'm actually going to make you right in the process. Now, he doesn't say all this right here. He says this as his ministry is unfolding. He says you can't fatten, and this, and this is amazing, you can't just take me and try to interject me into your old system. You have to have a completely new system. I want you to listen to this. I, th this is... It is long. No communicator should quote something this long. I apologize in advance. Please listen. It's amazing. The parables illustrate the radical posture and presumption of Jesus. Jesus is the new patch and the new wine. He is not an attachment, addition, or appendage to the status quo. He cannot be integrated into or contained by pre-existing structures. Even Judaism, Torah, and the synagogue. Torah is the the uh, Old Testament uh, law there, he's referring to a specific section of it which they added to. He is, of course, neither ascetic nor anarchist, and thus he participates as a human being in human structure. Oh, this is amazing. He goes to the synagogue, but not as everyone else goes to the synagogue. Jesus goes with a new teaching. He is like the scribes in that he teaches, but his authority surpasses theirs. He honors Torah by sending the healed paralytic to make the offering required by Moses, but he is not bound by Torah. He breaks it when it impedes his ministry, and he subordinates it to himself. His contemporaries exclaim, we have never seen anything like this. He relinquishes himself completely, though never surrendering his divine authority. He gives himself in service, though rendering allegiance to none but God. He gives his life to the world, but he is not a captive of the world. The question posed by the image of the wedding feast and the two Adam-like parables is not whether disciples will, like sewing a new patch on an old garment or refilling an old container, will not make room for Jesus in their already full agendas and lives. The question is whether they will forsake business as usual and join the wedding celebration whether they will become entirely new receptacles for the expanding fermentation of Jesus and the gospel in their lives. Let me, let me pare this down and give you a summary. The question is not will you fit Jesus into your life. The question is, will your life be given over to him? You can't just take a little bit of Jesus, put it into a system that is designed to fail because it's a man-made rule-based system. And then expect everything to be okay. The, the, the dating system that we have in America today, I know of nothing that is more psychologically damaging than the dating system we have. It is set up for failure. So rather than trying to say, how can I get just a little bit of Jesus in there? What I would say is this. We need to think outside and say, wait a minute. What is the ideal? What is the ideal from God? Now, I'm going to make this very, very simple. I did not have them put this up on the screen because I wanted you to hear it. It is so short. But listen, here is God's ideal for dating. One passage, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. You ready? Paul is writing to Timothy, the pastor. He's already told them, set the example for the whole congregation. In other words, the way that you live, this is the way that people should be observing you and following Jesus in this. This is how Jesus did it. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers. Older women as mothers. Here's dating. You ready? Younger women as sisters. In all purity. God's ideal for dating, regardless of age, regardless of stage, here's the ideal. Treat women as sisters. 
That's it. Now, what we can do is start adding a whole bunch of rules and regulations and laws to that, and we can say, okay, well, since it says to treat them as sisters, well, then here's what I'm going to do. And this is what the church has done historically. They said, all right, so because we want to treat them with purity and treat them as sisters, so whatever you would do with your sister is what you can do with your date. That's what the scriptures say. So what we do is we say, all right, well, let's create a system. And I remember this one. (laughs) This one was going on while I was in high school. Youth pastors all over America teaching this principle right here. You ready? You can do whatever you want to with a girl as long as it's from the neck up. Really? So I can take a baseball bat and and, and bash her in the head as many times as I want because that's from the neck up. Treat her as a sister. Anything from the neck up. Now, what's happened in the last several years, too, is we've come out with this whole other system that we say, well, you know, we're, we know that dating is, 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 a, is a bad idea, and, and so we're going to get rid of that whole system, and which I don't want to do. Uh, anyway, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to make it such that uh, we're not even going to talk about dating. Tomorrow, when we have the follow-up blog on this, I'm going to give you um, a a list of some resources that I think will be helpful. I've divided them out into categories. So in other words, I think that what takes place in the context of a high school relationship is different than what should take place in the context of a college relationship. And then what takes place post-college, I think, is even different from there. So I've divided them out as to what might be helpful. I would say this. In high school, I do think it's a good idea to say, you know what, let's just abandon the whole system. It's just a bad idea. High school students, I've worked with them for 20 years, High school students are just not ready for the current dating system in America because what they try to do is to get a little mini marriage and nobody is ready for it emotionally. Now, and and just one more quick one. Also because the system is set up to exalt the top 2% of high school students because the system is set up for those who are pretty, those who are popular, and those who are part of the in-group And the gospel says, I'm coming for those who are on the outside, those who don't fit in. That's who I'm coming after. To try to fit Jesus into a pretty system just doesn't work. In college, I'd say you can probably get closer to what we have in the present dating system, but I think there's some some places of wisdom that would be helpful um, in navigating that. And then post after that, I think that there's even more. So look for those resources in terms of the specifics of it. I don't want to give you the specifics. What I want to do just to close our time uh, is this. I want to point you towards five characteristic traits, whether you're in high school now, whether you're in college now, whether you're out of college, whether you are divorced and looking to get remarried. It doesn't matter to me. Look for five characteristic traits in a person of the opposite sex. This is what I think the scriptures would have us uh, to do. So, What to look for, um, guys and a woman. I've been given uh, these five things here um, to high school students for the better part of 15 years. And uh, so this list hasn't changed uh, during that time. Five character traits to look for in a woman. Number one, look for a woman that is gentle. I want to read a passage to you from 1 Peter chapter 3. It says this, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that Even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. And when they see your respectful and pure conduct, let your adorning be, uh, let not your adorning be external, meaning the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Don't get lost in much of the culture here. Please hear this. Look for a woman that is, first of all, gentle. It's a great word in the original language. The original language, the word is prous. It means strength that is under control. It does not mean weakness. It means strength. 
In classical Greek literature, it was used of a horse that had this wild stallion that would be taken out of the wild, brought into a place where it could be trained, broken in, and then even the smallest of children would be placed on its back and be trusted in there. It had all of its strength, all of its power under control. For a woman, first of all, who is gentle. Second of all, it says a woman who is quiet, meaning a quiet spirit. This does not mean silent. It does not mean an introverted personality. It does not mean she does not have an opinion. It means this, that in the depths of her soul, she is at peace because God is on his throne. Meaning that she is not given to anxiety. Now, let me just pause for just a moment because I know what just happened with every woman in the building. You went, great. He just said that I can't be anxious. That's not the kind of woman that, uh, that we should be looking for. Okay. Please hear this. Please, please hear this. What Peter is not saying is that a woman who has arrived with no more room to grow Please, ladies, if you are in your 20s right now, please do not compare yourself to your godly grandmother who's been walking with the Lord for 50-plus years. The Lord has had a lot of time to work on her, to mold her, to fashion her. She is probably patient beyond what you are right now. And do not think because you don't measure up to her that you don't meet the biblical standard. What it means is that you're on track. You're on road with this. You're, You're moving forward in your strength under control, and in your peace in what God is doing. So guys, let me say it this way. Do you observe growth in her? Do you see her regularly and consistently saying, I want to be at peace? And do you see God bringing that 100% of the time? Are you nuts? No. And you see a track record of this. This is her life. This is the direction that she is headed, being more and more conformed into the image of the only one who has existed without anxiety. A woman who is gentle, quiet. Thirdly, a woman who is humble. Proverbs 3, 34 says this, Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. Humble, we said this in the past here, humble does not mean that she thinks less of herself than she really is, but that she sees herself as she really is. She sees herself with accuracy. She knows what her gifts are and what they are not. She's not trying to become something you're not. Here's the, in my opinion, one of the greatest dangers in dating in America, in uh, in our particular system, again, at any age, is that oftentimes I'm trying to present to you an image that I think that you will like and accept rather than just giving to you who I really am. A woman who is humble is one who says, this is who I am. She's okay with that. Third, I mean fourth, a woman who is discreet. Proverbs eleven twenty two, Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. Women are agents of God's beauty. It's just a reality. There's no argument here. No one is going to stop me from the stage and go, you know what, actually I think men are the more beautiful of the creatures. Women are agents of God's beauty. It's not just your looks. It's not just your appearance. It's the way that you conduct yourself with grace and dignity. You are better than we are. And what I mean by that is better is um, you are more civil. You are, all that's good. A woman who has all of this beauty and who shows no discretion in flaunting that beauty. Dudes, be careful. But when you find a woman who shows discretion, no, no, that, that is beautiful. I can tell you this with all sincerity. My wife, yes, she is beautiful on the outside. She is far more beautiful on the inside than she is on the out. And the outside is fading. It will continue to fade. That's what the scriptures say. But I promise you, she gets more beautiful to me. I'm not just saying that for the stage. She's not here. She won't go back and listen to this. I promise she's going to listen to my sermons. I'm not getting any brownie points from this. It's just a fact. Lastly, a woman who is submissive. 
Ephesians 5, 21 and 22, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. He's speaking to wives and husbands here. Submit to one another. He says specifically, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Job 22, verses 21 and 22 says this, agree with God, that verb, that verb there means submit. Agree with God and be at peace. Thereby good will come to you. Receive instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. What we mean by submissive is not a doormat because I'm going to have the exact same category for a guy here in just a minute. Okay? When I say submissive, it does not mean that um, you're a doormat. Guys, look for this. Do you see a track record in her life where she is submitting in three directions? Number one, that she submits first and foremost to the Lord himself. If she sees it in the scriptures and chooses to ignore it in the scriptures, do not align yourself with her. Is she, first of all, submitting her life to the Lord? Second of all, did you see a track record of her while it was appropriate? Uh, and, and if it's the case now, is she submitting rightfully to her parents? Now, she's out of the house, different standard, different application there, but do you see a submission to, to her parents? Finally, do you see a submission to her authorities in general, meaning bosses, meaning coaches, teachers, et cetera, in an appropriate manner? Do you see a track record of that? If you do, it says a lot about her character. Finally, a warning to men. The warning is just simply this. Proverbs 31, 30 says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Men, do not be enamored with the outside. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm not saying that you should ignore it. I'm not saying you shouldn't have preferences. I'm not saying, what I'm saying is, do not be enamored with the outside because the outside will eventually fade. But a woman who fears the Lord, she is greatly to be praised. Marriage is the second most important decision that you will make in your life. The first and most important decision is will you follow Jesus? Marriage is the second most important decision. Trust me on this one. Choose character every day of the week over looks. Just trust me. God's ideal, a woman who fears the Lord. Real quickly, because I'm already over my time. Men, passage to look at here is 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 7. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Ladies, look for a man who has these five characteristics and traits. Number one, look for a man who is wise. Proverbs 13, 20, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Do you see him, ladies, consistently seeking out, searching for others who are further along the road than him, and he is looking for their input and their wisdom? If you find a guy, a young man, who is consistently ignoring counsel from olders, stay away. He's an idiot. And there's going to come a time in which he needs to lean in on you heavily in marriage. And if he doesn't have a track record of leaning in to others, he's not going to do it with you. And he's going to take you down a road. Do you see wisdom in him? Do you see him walking with the wise? Do you see him making good decisions? Just real quick, though. Please, ladies, do not hold men to the same standard that we would hold you. In other words... To a certain level, men will never, ever grow up. We will always be a certain level of Peter Pan. Okay, I'm not saying that you, okay, if you were to watch me with my children, okay, we just made tiny little bottle rockets, okay, and we had a little bottle rocket war um, in there. Don't hold us to the same standard. We're going to do some things time to time that are just stupid and get people get hurt. Okay, I'm not talking about small, I'm talking about major decisions in life. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, wise. Number two, look for a man who is self-controlled. Proverbs 25, 28, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. 
Do you see a track record of him being able to restrain his flesh and say yes to the Holy Spirit to say no to his desires? Can I just get very real for just a moment? Ladies, the first place you need to look for in this is, is he able to control himself with you? His primary job is to protect and to provide for you. And the first place he needs to protect you from is from himself. Is he showing self-restraint there? If not, be careful. Do you see him showing restraint in other areas of life? Do you see a tracker of him trying? I know what just happened, and then I said this. Is every guy in the room went, great. Great, because I'm not the model of self-restraint, and because I'm an idiot, I'm not wise all the time, I just failed. And what I'm saying is this. Not in perfection, but you're on the road. You see a track record of growth in there. I, it, the worst thing I can do is to compare myself to my father, who is 72 or 3 years old now. The Lord's had a lot more time to work on him. He's a lot wiser, and he's a lot more restrained than I am. <laughs> Thirdly, look for a man who is submissive. Same two passages, so I won't read them again. Same three areas. Ladies, do you see that this man is submissive first and foremost to God? That he's saying, if the word of God says it, then I will choose to adjust my life to it rather than trying to manipulate and skirt and get around. Do you see a track record of him having a submissive attitude towards his parents? Do you see a track record of him having a submissive attitude towards his authorities, his bosses? Does he talk about his boss who is just an idiot? Who clearly doesn't know as much as he knows? From time to time, to let that be a release, to be able to get that statement out maybe okay, but if he consistently views all those in authority around him as morons, stay away. Fourthly, do you see a man who is serving? Jesus in John 13 said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Do you see him looking regularly and consistently to place himself up underneath others so that he might exalt them? Here's the big reason why. God has called him, according to the scriptures, to have authority over the woman, not better than their equal in value, substance and glory, different role and function. The way he ought to be using that authority is by consistently placing himself underneath his bride to exalt her. His needs are the ones that are to go unmet so that her needs might be met. Do you see him regularly and consistently doing this for others? If not, probably not a good chance he's going to do it with you. Lastly, is he loving? Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Nowhere in the scriptures is the wife commanded to love her husband. All throughout the scriptures, the husband is commanded to love his bride. Do you see him doing things that are best for others in the long run? Do you see him consistently saying, I want to do the most loving thing that I can do? A warning. Warning from 1 Corinthians 15, 33. This is where I close. Ladies, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Ladies, if you don't see character in him right now, trust me, you're not going to change him. The odds are he's going to change you. The ideal is treat them as sisters. Ladies, treat them as brothers. Search for character. That will never change. Let me pray.
Father, thank you for who you are, for what you have done. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the ultimate groom, the ultimate husband, that you have laid out what is necessary for us. You have also shown us, Lord, what it looks like to submit yourself to the Father. You have shown us what it looks like to be submissive. So Jesus, today we are asking that you would fill us with your power to do what only you can do. Father, I pray now for wisdom that you would provide for all who are dating, for all who are trying to rear children to date wisely. Would you pour out your wisdom on us? We want to do it according to your ideals. We don't want to go too far. We don't want to go too short, and so we need wisdom. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.